Hello. First tonight, what lessons can we learn from the deep freeze this winter? A winter of broken bones and potholes. A winter when the roads iced over and the grit ran out. In fact, it was the coldest winter for more than 30 years. Sub-zero temperatures became the norm and that had huge implications right across the board. Some county councils looked as if they would run out of grit, forcing the government to intervene. The NHS reported a huge rise in accidents as people tripped on slippery roads. Insurance companies said they experienced a 15% rise in car accident claims, whilst thousands of potholes meant another big bill for the highways people. John Mapp reports. The snow brought much of our road network to a standstill. So did the authorities get it right? Today, at a sun-soaked Silverstone, next to the region's clearest stretch of road, those authorities held a summit to agree on how to do it better next time. Organised by Northamptonshire County Council, True Grit was the first national summit of its kind, drawing delegates from as far afield as Northumberland, representing councils, grit suppliers and motoring organisations. The result was four clear recommendations. The first idea is for a regional salt depot, so that we're less reliant on supplies coming all the way from Cheshire. If we had regional supplies available, then each of the local authorities would be able to call those down much quicker. They wouldn't have to rely on the long journeys coming out of Cheshire to bring salt into the region. Therefore, we would see that salt back on the highway where we need it quickly. That allows commercial vehicles to get access to the road network. The second proposal is for our county councils to be less wasteful with grit, so that they use snow ploughs to clear the roads first and don't put grit down on heavy snow. The third idea is for the government to better police our council's salt supplies, so we don't get the situation we saw this winter where some councils had to give grit to others. And the fourth idea is for money from the NHS to be redirected into gritting pavements, so we don't see so many people in a and &E. I don't know what a replacement hip costs, let's say... £10,000, £15,000. Well, that money can be put into gritting the pavements or looking after the pavements, saving older people all that pain, saving the community a lot of money, um, saving national health money in the long run. It's unlikely all the recommendations will be enforced, but there is a sense it's now time for Plan B. Joel Mapp, BBC Look East, Silverstone. Well, let's talk to Heather Smith, a councillor in Northamptonshire. She was at that conference today. This regional salt depot, would that work? Because if they need it somewhere else in the country, they're still going to take our salt, aren't they? We've really got to sort out all the details. Excuse me, I've got a cough. Um, we've got to sort out all the detail of how it would actually work. But it's a long way from Cheshire to Northamptonshire, and some counties are even further south than us. So if we can hold more stocks on a regional basis that we've got easy access to. It would save quite a lot of time and it will also mean that we've got higher stocks available within the region. This idea of wasting less grit, a lot of people will read that as saying putting less grit on the roads, which probably is not what a lot of people would like to hear. Um, I think we were very fortunate in our county that we've got a head of highways who came from Scotland, so he's very experienced of dealing with... Um, Salt, very snowy conditions up in Scotland. So he knew that there wasn't really any point in putting salt and grit down on top of snow because it really won't do anything. You've got to clear the snow first and he would actually... Um, all our vehicles were equipped with a snow plough on the front and then the salt and grit just came out from the back. So we were only using one vehicle. But we were making sure that we weren't putting salt and grit on the roads until the snow was cleared. Now, that didn't happen in every other authority, and we believe that a number of authorities were just putting out salt, pure salt, straight on top of snow, and that was actually wasting it because it wouldn't do anything. So we have to make sure that the message is out to every local authority in the country that you don't need to do it in that way and that there are better ways of doing things, and if salt is running short, you can mix it with sand and grit to make it go further. Heather Smith, thank you very much for being with us. Hope your cold gets better. Now the sheltered housing complex where the people who live there have been told they can no longer cook for each other. Wilford Furlong has a communal kitchen. But the council says it shouldn't be used in case somebody gets food poisoning. 
Do you want a cup of tea, Eva? No, I'll have coffee. You want coffee? Thanks. Dress for the occasion, but nothing to cook. Bill Watson and Yvonne Jarvis like making meals for their fellow residents, but are now only allowed to make coffee for each other. They can't even make a sandwich or bring in a homemade cake. I think it's health and safety gone mad. That's all I think. So, so why all of a sudden health and safety, can't do this, can't do that? Where's health and safety in, in the kitchen? As long as you're, you're sensible, then what can go wrong? I took the food and hygiene certificate last May um, and now, they, unfortunately, they've uh, taken it all away. So it's a certificate wasted and the, and the council paid for it. Bill Watson and Yvonne Jarvis used to cook for 40 people once a month. It was a social occasion. The food's been excellent. Um, I've been to restaurants and paid really good money for food that's not as good as Bill and Yvonne's food. But would you sue them if you got food poisoning? No. I mean, at the end of the day, I could get food poisoning from the chippy. Last year, a group of pensioners in Norwich were told their fish and chip run would have to stop because of health and safety concerns. In 2008, this Bedfordshire couple were told by officials these pictures would have to go because of similar reasons. And there were the hanging flower baskets banned because the posts couldn't support their weight. Late this afternoon, the council backtracked. We were alerted to a potential issue that may have had an impact on tenants. We've checked it out as a reasonable landlord should, uh, and we've very close now to getting the, giving the green light to, to carry on again. Bill Watson and Yvonne Jarvis are pleased they won't be hanging up their uniforms forever. Debbie Tubby, Bibs of East, Cambridgeshire. Officials at Northamptonshire County Cricket Club say the club could not survive in its present form without the money it gets from satellite television. Many people believe Ashes cricket should be available on terrestrial television, that it should become one of the so-called crown jewels, like the Cup Final and Wimbledon. We'll hear from their chief executive in a moment, but first, the background from Tom Williams. Remarkable scenes. England's victorious Ashes team of 2005, the nation celebrated. Last year's series, though, the first time home tests against Australia had not been available on terrestrial TV. The result, another England win, but a loss of millions of viewers. Sky's current deal's worth a whopping £300 million. Money the England and Wales Cricket Board distributes between the national side, county cricket and the grassroots game. But for how much longer? I'm well aware of the very strong support in this house and in the country at large uh, for the return of Test cricket to free TV television. Uh, we will consider all of the representations made uh, very carefully. So the Ashes could return to all our screens in seven years, but can county cricket survive? Tom Williams, BBC Look East. Well, earlier today I spoke to Mark Tagg, Chief Executive of Northampton's Cricket Club, and I began by asking him what the club would have to forego if it lost the money from Sky. We do, I think, 2,000 hours of coaching throughout the, country, throughout the county with our coaches, our community coaches. We visit countless schools, we work with the clubs to try and get youngsters who are interested in the game and get an idea of the game, try and get them educated and working with clubs and through their schools to try and make them the supporters and the lovers of cricket in the future. You're talking there about inspiring the next generation of, of cricket players, but um, mm. uh, in 2005, 8 million people watched The Ashes on Channel 4. Last year, Sky got fewer than a million viewers. If we're talking about reaching the masses then free-to-air television has to be the answer, doesn't it? Yeah, uh, there, there is that point. But what happened with the 2005 series was there was an immediate spike in interest. For the next two or three weeks and a couple of months afterwards, there was an increase in interest. But subsequent to that, that interest has tailed off. But you coped before the Sky contract came along, so why couldn't you cope again? Yeah, county cricket was different then. We were all smaller counties. We didn't have the ambitions. we have undergoing a great deal of progress and development work here with our team we're getting a very good team we're developing the ground we're putting floodlights up without the additional money we won't be able to stay at that pinnacle we won't be able to generate whatever we need to do to get the next Monty Panasar and Graham Swan from this county we won't be able to inspire the youngsters I'm talking to you at the moment I know as a chief executive of a county cricket club but just let me for a moment talk to you as a cricket fan wouldn't you ideally want your neighbours, your friends, your children, your community to be able to watch, to be able to access the Ashes, not just those who subscribe to Sky? 
I would love everybody to be able to access cricket as a whole. Obviously, they can come down here to watch it live. But yes, if people could access the Ashes free to wear, but if then the game got a reasonable amount of money from that, the last time um, the Ashes were up for bids or cricket was up for bids, the BBC didn't actually bid for any of the available packages. So it's not as if we're not making the Ashes and all cricket available to terrestrial um, supplies. It's not, they just don't provide the money and the finance and we need to make the game viable across all levels. Mark Tag, thank you very much indeed.